Mort to Arthur by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake in Long Branch, New Jersey. So all day long the noise of battle rolled among the mountains by the winter sea, until King Arthur's table, man by man, had fallen in lioness about their lord, King Arthur. Then, because his wound was deep, the bold Sir Bedivere uplifted him, Sir Bedivere, the last of all his knights, and bore him to a chapel nigh the field, a broken chancel with a broken cross that stood on a dark strait of barren land. On one side lay the ocean, and on one lay a great water, and the moon was full. Then spake King Arthur to Sir Bedivere, The sequel of today unsolders all the goodliest fellowship of famous knights whereof this world holds record. Such a sleep they sleep, the men I loved. I think that we shall never more, at any future time, delight our souls with talk of knightly deeds, walking about the gardens and the halls of Camelot, as in the days that were. I perish by this people which I made, though Merlin swear that I should come again to rule once more. But let what will be, be. I am so deeply smitten through the helm that without help I cannot last till morn. Thou therefore take my brand Excalibur, which was my pride, for thou rememberest how, in those old days, one summer noon, an arm rose up out of the bosom of the lake, clothed in white samite, mystic, wonderful, holding the sword, and how I rode across and took it, and have worn it like a king. And wheresoever I am sung or told in aftertime, this also shall be known. But now delay not, take Excalibur, and fling him far into the middle mere. Watch what thou seest, and lightly bring me word. To him replied the bold Sir Bedivere, It is not meet, Sir King, to leave thee thus, aidless alone and smitten through the helm. A little thing may harm a wounded man. Yet I thy hest will all perform at full. Watch what I see, and lightly bring thee word. So saying, from the ruined shrine he stepped, and in the moon athwart the place of tombs, where lay the mighty bones of ancient men, old knights, and over them the sea wind sang shrill chill with flakes of foam. He stepped down by zigzag paths and juts of pointed rock, came on the shining levels of the lake. There he drew forth the brand Excalibur, and o'er him drawing it the winter moon brightening the skirts of a long cloud, ran forth and sparkled keen with frost against the hilt, for all the haft twinkled with diamond sparks, myriads of topaz lights, and jacinth work of subtlest jewelry. He gazed so long that both his eyes were dazzled as he stood, this way and that dividing the swift mine in act to throw. But at the last it seemed better to leave Excalibur concealed there in the many knotted water flags that whistled stiff and dry about the marge. So strode he back slow to the wounded king. Then spake King Arthur to Bedivere, Hast thou performed my mission which I gave? What is thou hast seen, or what hast heard? An answer made the bold to Bedivere, I heard the ripple washing in the reeds, and the wild water lapping on the crag. To whom replied King Arthur, faint and pale, Thou hast betrayed thy nature and thy name, not rendering true answer, as beseemed thy fealty, nor like a noble knight. For surer sign had followed, either hand or voice, or else a motion of the mere. This is a shameful thing for men to lie, Yet now I charge thee, quickly go again, as thou art leaf and dear, and do the thing I bade thee. Watch, and lightly bring me word. Then went Sir Bedivere the second time across the ridge, and paced beside the mere, counting the dewy pebbles, fixed in thought. But when he saw the wonder of the hilt, how curiously and strangely chaste, he smote his palms together, and he cried aloud, 
and if indeed I cast the brand away, surely the precious thing, one worthy note, should thus be lost for ever from the earth, which might have pleased the eyes of many men. What good should follow this, if this were done? What harm undone? Deep harm to disobey, seeing obedience is the bond of rule. Were it well to obey, then, if a king demand an act unprofitable against himself? The king is sick, and knows not what he does. What record or what relic of my lord should be to aftertime, but empty breath and rumors of doubt? But were this kept, stored in some treasure-house of mighty kings, someone might show it in a joust of arms, saying, King Arthur's sword Excalibur, wrought by the lovely maiden of the lake. Nine years she wrought it, sitting in the depths upon the hidden bases of the hills. So might some old man speak in the aftertime to all the people, winning reverence. But now much honor and much fame were lost. So spake he, clouded with his own conceit, and hid Excalibur the second time, and so strode back slow to the wounded king. Then spoke King Arthur, breathing heavily, What is it thou hast seen, or what has heard? An answer made the bold Sir Bedivere. I heard the water lapping on the crag, and the long ripple washing in the reeds. To whom replied King Arthur, much in wrath, Ah, miserable and unkind, untrue, unknightly traitor-hearted, woe is me! Authority forgets a dying king, laid widowed of the power of his eye that bowed the will. I see thee what thou art, for thou, the latest left of all my knights, in whom should meet the offices of all, thou wouldst betray me for the precious hilt, either from lust of gold or like a girl vaulting the giddy pleasures of the eyes. Yet, for a man may fail in duty twice, and the third time may prosper, get thee hence. But if thou spare to fling Excalibur, I will arise and slay thee with my hands. Then quickly rose Sir Bedivere and ran, and leaping down the ridges lightly, plunged among the bulrush beds and clutched the sword and strongly wheeled, and threw it. The great brand made lightning in the splendor of the moon, and flashing round and round, and whirled in an arc, shot like a streamer in the northern morn. See where the moving isles of winter shock by night with noises of the northern sea. So flashed and fell the brand Excalibur. But ere he dipped the surface, rose an arm clothed in white samite, mystic, wonderful, and caught him by the hilt, and brandished him three times, and drew him under in the mere, and lightly went the other to the king. Then spoke King Arthur, drawing thicker breath, Now I see by thine eyes that this is done. Speak out, what is it thou hast heard or seen? An answer made the bold Sir Bedivere, Sir King, I close mine eyelids, lest the gem should blind my purpose, for I never saw nor shall see here or elsewhere till I die, not though I live three lives of mortal men, so great a miracle as yonder hilt. Then with both hands I flung him, wheeling him, but when I looked again, behold, an arm, clothed in white samite, mystic, wonderful, that caught him by the hilt, and brandished him three times, and drew him under in the mere. An answer made King Arthur, breathing hard, My end draws nigh, tis time that I were gone. Make broad thy shoulder to receive my weight, and bear me to the margin. Yet I fear my wound hath taken cold, and I shall die. So saying, from the pavement he half rose, slowly, with pain, reclining on his arm, and looking wistfully with wide blue eyes, as in a picture. Him Sir Bedivere remorsefully regarded through his tears, and would have spoken, but he found not words. Then took with care, and kneeling on one knee, 
O'er both his shoulders drew the languid hands, And rising bore him through the place of tombs. But as he walked King Arthur panted hard, Like one that feels a nightmare on his bed When all the house is mute. So sighed the king, muttering and murmuring in his ear, Quick, quick, I fear it is too late, and I shall die. But the other swiftly strode from ridge to ridge, clothed with his breath, and looking, as he walked, larger than human on the frozen hills. He heard the deep behind him, and a cry before. His own thought drove him like a goad. Dry clashed his harness in the icy caves and the barren chasms, and all to left and right the bare black cliff clanged round him, as he based his feet on juts of slippery crag that rang sharp smitten with the dint of armed heels. And on a sudden, lo, the level lake and the long glories of the winter morn. Then saw they how there hove a dusky barge, dark as a funeral scar from stem to stern beneath them. And descending, they were ware that all the decks were dense with stately forms, black-stoled, black-hooded like a dream. But these three queens with crowns of gold, and from them rose a cry that shivered to the tingling stars, and as it were one voice, an agony of lamentation, like a wind that shrills all night in a wasteland, where no one comes or hath come since the making of the world. Then murmured Arthur, Place me on the barge. And to the barge they came. There those three queens put forth their hands and took the king and wept. But she that rose the tallest of them all and fairest laid his head upon her lap and loosened the shattered cask and chafed his hands and called him by his name, complaining loud and dropping bitter tears against his brow striped with dark blood. For all his face was white and colorless, like the withered moon smote by the fresh beam of the springing east, and all his greaves and creases dashed with drops of onset, and the light and lustrous curl that made his forehead like a rising sun high from the dais throne were parched with dust or clotted into points and hanging loose, mixed with the nightly growth that fringe his lips. So like a shattered column lay the king, not like that Arthur who, with lance at rest, from spur to plume a star of tournament, shot through the lists at Camelot, and charged before the eyes of ladies and kings. Then loudly cried the bold Sir Bedivere, Ah, my lord Arthur, whither shall I go? Where shall I hide my forehead and my eyes? For now I see the true old times are dead. When every morning brought a noble chance, And every chance brought out a noble knight. Such times have not been Since the light that led the holy elders With the gift of myrrh. And now the whole round table is dissolved, Which was an image of the mighty world. And I, the last, go forth companionless. And the days darken round me, And the years among new men, strange faces, other minds. And slowly answered Arthur from the barge, The old order changeth, yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. Comfort thyself, what comfort is in me. I have lived my life, and that which I have done may he within himself make pure. But thou, if thou shouldst never see my face again, pray for my soul. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Wherefore, let thy voice rise like a fountain for me day and night. For what are men better than sheep or goats that nourish a blind life within the brain? If, knowing God, they lift not hands of prayer both for themselves and for those who call them friend. For so the whole round earth is every way bound by gold chains about the feet of God. But now farewell. I am going a long way with these thou seest, if indeed I go, 
for all my mind is clouded with a doubt, to the island valley of Avalon, where falls not hail or rain or any snow, nor ever wind blows loudly, but it lies deep meadowed, happy, fair with orchard lawns and bowery hollows crowned with summer sea, where I will heal me of my grievous wounds. So said he, and the barge with oar and sail moved from the brink, like some full-breasted swan that fluting a wild carol ere her death ruffles her pure cold plume and takes the flood with swarthy webs. Long stood Sir Bedivere, revolving many memories, till the hull looked one black dot against the verge of dawn, and on the mere the wailing died away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Kristen Hughes. The Lady of Shalott by Alfred Lord Tennyson. 1833 edition. On either side the river lie long fields of barley and of rye that clothe the wold and meet the sky. And through the field the road runs by to many towered Camelot. The yellow leaved water lily, the green she the daffodilly, tremble in the water chilly round about Shalott. Willows whiten, aspens shiver, the sunbeam showers break and quiver in the stream that runneth ever by the island in the river, flowing down to Camelot. Four grey walls and four grey towers overlook a space of flowers, and the silent isle embowers the Lady of Shalott. Underneath the bearded barley, the reaper, reaping late and early, hears her ever chanting cheerly, like an angel singing clearly o'er the stream of Camelot. Piling sheaves and furrows airy, beneath the moon, the reaper weary listening whispers, "'Tis the fairy lady of Shalott." The little isle is all enrailed with a rose fence, and o'er trailed with roses. By the marge unhailed the shallop flitteth, silken sailed, skimming down to Camelot. A pearl garland winds her head, she leaneth on a velvet bed, fully, royally apparelled, the Lady of Shalott. No time hath she to sport and play, a charmed web she weaves all way. A curse is on her if she stay her weaving either night or day to look down to Camelot. She knows not what the curse may be, therefore she weaveth steadily. Therefore no other care hath she, the Lady of Shalott. She lives with little joy or fear, Over the water running near The sheep-bell tinkles in her ear. Before her hangs a mirror clear, Reflecting towered Camelot. And as the mazy web she whirls, She sees the surly village churls, And the red cloaks of market girls Pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, An abbot on an ambling pad, Sometimes a curly shepherd lad, Or long-haired page in crimson clad Goes by to towered Camelot. And sometimes through the mirror blue The knights come riding two and two. She hath no loyal knight and true, The Lady of Shalott. But in her web she still delights To weave the mirror's magic sights, for often, through the silent nights, a funeral with plumes and lights and music came from Camelot. Or when the moon was overhead, came two young lovers, lately wed. I am half sick of shadows, said the Lady of Shalott. A bow shot from a bower eaves, he rode between the barley sheaves. The sun came dazzling through the leaves and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold Sir Lancelot. A red-cross knight for ever kneeled to a lady in his shield, 
that sparkled on the yellow field beside remote Shalott. The gemmy bridle glittered free, like to some branch of stars we see hung in the golden galaxy. The bridle bells rang merrily as he rode down from Camelot, and from his blazoned baldric slung a mighty silver bugle hung, and as he rode his armor rung beside remote Shalott. All in the blue unclouded weather, thick jeweled shone the saddle leather, the helmet, and the helmet feather burned like one burning flame together, as he rode down from Camelot. As often through the purple night, below the starry clusters bright, some bearded meteor trailing light moves over green Shalott. His broad clear brow in sunlight glowed, on burnished hooves his war-horse trod. From underneath his helmet flowed his coal-black curls as on he rode, as he rode down from Camelot. From the bank and from the river he flashed into the crystal mirror. Tira lira, tira lira, sang Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room. She saw the water-flower bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume, she looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide, the mirror cracked from side to side. The curse is come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning, the broad stream in his banks complaining, heavily, the low sky raining over towered Camelot. Outside the isle a shallow boat beneath a willow lay afloat. Below the carven stern she wrote, The Lady of Shalott. A cloud-white crown of pearl she dight, All raimented in snowy white that loosely flew, Her zone in sight, Clasped with one blinding diamond bright, Her wide eyes fixed on Camelot. Though the squally east wind keenly blew, With folded arms serenely by the water Stood the queenly lady of Shalott. With a steady, stony glance, Like some bold seer in a trance, Beholding all his own mischance, Mute, with a glassy countenance, She looked down to Camelot. It was the closing of the day, she loosed the chain, and down she lay. The broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott. As when to sailors while they roam, By creeks and outfalls far from home, Rising and dropping with the foam. From dying swans wild warblings come, Blown shoreward, so to Camelot. Still, as the boat had wound along the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her chanting her death song, the Lady of Shalott. A long drawn carol, mournful, holy, she chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her eyes were darkened wholly, and her smooth face, sharpened, slowly turned to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide the first house by the waterside, Singing, in her song she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, A pale, pale corpse she floated by, Dead cold between the houses high, Dead into towered Camelot. Knight and burgher, lord and dame, to the planked wharfage came. Below the stern they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. They crossed themselves, their stars they blessed, knight, minstrel, abbot, squire, and guest. There lay a parchment on her breast that puzzled more than all the rest, the well-fed wits at Camelot. The web was woven curiously, the charm is broken utterly. 
draw near, and fear not. This is I, the Lady of Shalott. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lady of Shalott, 1842 version, by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri for LibriVox.org. On either side the river lie long fields of barley and of rye that clothe the world and meet the sky, and through the field the road runs by to many towered Camelot. And up and down the people go, gazing where the lilies blow, round an island there below, the island of Shalott. Willows whiten, aspens quiver, little breezes dusk and shiver, through the wave that runs for ever by the island in the river, flowing down to Camelot. Four gray walls and four gray towers overlook a space of flowers, and the silent isle embowers the Lady of Shalott. By the margin, willow-veiled, slide the heavy barges trailed by slow horses, and unhailed the shallop flitteth silken-sailed, skimming down to Camelot. But who hath seen her wave her hand, or at the casement seen her stand, or is she known in all the land, the Lady of Shalott? Only reapers, reaping early, in among the bearded barley, hear a song that echoes cheerly from the river winding clearly down to towered Camelot. And by the moon the reaper weary, piling sheaves in uplands airy, listening, whispers, "'Tis the fairy lady of Shalott." Part Two. There she weaves by night and day a magic web with colors gay. She has heard a whisper say, A curse is on her if she stay to look down to Camelot. She knows not what the curse may be, and so she weaveth steadily, and little other care hath she the Lady of Shalott. And moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her all the year, shadows of the world appear. There she sees the highway near winding down to Camelot. There the river eddy whirls, and there the surly village churls and the red cloaks of market girls pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, an abbot on an ambling pad, Sometimes a curly shepherd lad, or long-haired page in crimson clad, goes by to towered Camelot. And sometimes through the mirror blue the knights come riding, two and two. She hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. But in her web she still delights, to weave the mirror's magic sights, for often through the silent nights a funeral, with plumes and lights and music, went to Camelot. Or when the moon was overhead came two young lovers, lately wed, I am half sick of shadows, said the Lady of Shalott. Part Three. A bowshot from her bower eaves, he rode between the barley sheaves, the sun came dazzling through the leaves, and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold Sir Lancelot. A red-cross knight forever kneeled to a lady in his shield, that sparkled on the yellow field, beside remote Shalott. The gemmy bridle glittered free, like to some branch of stars we see, hung in the golden galaxy. The bridle bells rang merrily as he rode down to Camelot, and from his blazoned baldric slung a mighty silver bugle hung, and as he rode his armor rung beside remote Shalott. All in the blue unclouded weather, thick jeweled shone the saddle leather, the helmet and the helmet feather burned like one burning flame together as he rode down to Camelot. As often through the purple night, below the starry clusters bright, some bearded meteor, trailing light, moves over still Shalott. His broad, clear brow in sunlight glowed, on burnished hooves his war-horse trode. From underneath his helmet flowed his coal-black curls as on he rode, as he rode down to Camelot. From the bank and from the river he flashed into the crystal mirror, Tira Lyra by the river, saying Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room. She saw the water-lily bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume. She looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide, the mirror cracked from side to side. The curse has come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. Part Four. In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning. 
the broad stream in his banks complaining, heavily the low sky raining over towered Camelot. Down she came and found a boat beneath a willow left afloat, and round about the prow she wrote, The Lady of Shalott. And down the river's dim expanse, like some bold seer in a trance, seeing all his own mischance, with a glassy countenance did she look to Camelot. And at the closing of the day she loosed the chain, and down she lay. The broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott. Lying robed in snowy white, that loosely flew to left and right, the leaves upon her falling light, through the noises of the night she floated down to Camelot. And as the boat had wound along, the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her singing her last song, the Lady of Shalott heard a carol mournful, holy, chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were darkened wholly, turned to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide, the first house by the waterside, singing in her song, she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, a gleaming shape she floated by, dead pale between the houses high, silent into Camelot. Out upon the wharfs they came, knight and burgher, lord and dame, and round the prow they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. Who is this, and what is here? And in the lighted palace near died the sound of royal cheer, and they crossed themselves for fear, all the knights at Camelot. But Lancelot mused a little space. He said, She has a lovely face. God in his mercy lend her grace, the Lady of Shalott. End of the Lady of Shalott by Alfred Lord Tennyson This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Kristen Hughes Sir Lancelot and Queen Guinevere, A Fragment by Alfred Lord Tennyson Like souls that balance joy and pain, With tears and smiles from heaven again, The maiden spring upon the plain Came in a sunlit fall of rain. In crystal vapour everywhere Blue aisles of heaven laughed between, And far, in forest deeps unseen, the topmost elm tree gathered green from draughts of balmy air. Sometimes the linnet piped his song, sometimes the throstle whistled strong, sometimes the sparhawk wheeled along, hushed all the groves from fear of wrong. By grassy capes with fuller sound in curves the yellowing river ran and drooping chestnut buds began to spread into the perfect fan above the teeming ground. Then, in the boyhood of the year, Sir Lancelot and Queen Guinevere rode through the coverts of the deer with blissful treble ringing clear. She seemed a part of joyous spring, a gown of grass-green silk she wore, buckled with golden clasps before. A light green tuft of plumes she bore Closed in a golden ring. Now on some twisted ivy net, Now by some tinkling rivulet, In mosses mixed with violet Her cream-white mule his pastern set, And fleeter now she skimmed the plains Than she whose elfin prancer springs By night to eerie warblings, When all the glimmering moorland Rings with jingling bridle reins. As she fled fast through sun and shade, The happy winds upon her played, Blowing the ringlet from the braid. She looked so lovely As she swayed the rain with dainty fingertips. A man had given all other bliss And all his worldly worth for this, To waste his whole heart In one kiss upon her perfect lips. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Kristen Hughes. The Day Before the Trial by Algernon Charles Swinburne. King Arthur says, being alone, now the day comes near and near, I feel its hot breath, and see it clear, How strange it is and full of fear, And I grow old, waiting here, Grow sick with pain of Guinevere, My wife that loves not me. So strange it seems to me, So new to have such shame between us two, I dare not hold this matter true, nor false, Because his words ran through my blood With all the shame they drew, and burnt me to the bone. I knew that some such tale would be, For all these years she grew more fair, More sweet her low sweet speeches were, More long and heavy grew her hair, Not such as other women wear. But ever as I looked on her, her face seemed fierce and thin. I felt half sick, and on my head the gold crown seemed not gold but lead. Strange words I heard that no man said, strange noises where all noise was dead. Was it pure blood that made her red from brows to rounded chin? Sometimes I knew she loved me not. Down to my hands the blood went hot In a dull hate of Lancelot, For all the praise of her he got, Being so pure of sin. For he was clean as any maid, And on his head God's hand was laid As on a maiden's, so men said. But I a woman's hands there weighed, Instead of God's upon my head. No maid was I, to see the white sangreal borne up in air, To touch at last God's body fair, To feel strange terror stir my hair, As a slow light went past. But here I had to my honours year by year, I had the name of king to bear, And watch the eyes of Guinevere, My wife, who loves not me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Guinevere by Sarah Teasdale I was a queen, and I have lost my crown, a wife, and I have broken all my vows, a lover, and I ruined him I loved. There is no other havoc left to do. A little month ago I was a queen, and mothers held their babies up to see, when I came riding out of Camelot. The women smiled, and all the world smiled too, and now what woman's eyes would smile on me? I am still beautiful, and yet what child would think of me as some high, heaven-sent thing? an angel clad in gold and miniver. The world would run from me, and yet I am no different from the queen they used to love. If water flowing silver over stones is forded and beneath the horse's feet grows turbid suddenly, it clears again, and men will drink it with no thought of harm. Yet I am branded for a single fault. I was the flower amid a toiling world, where people smiled to see one happy thing, and they were proud and glad to raise me high. They only asked that I should be right fair, a little kind and gowned wondrously. And surely it were little praise to me if I had pleased them well throughout my life. I was a queen, the daughter of a king. The crown was never heavy on my head. It was my right and part of me. The women thought me proud. The men were kind, and bowed down gallantly to kiss my hand, and watch me as I passed them calmly by. Along the halls I shall not tread again. What if, to-night, I should revisit them, 
the warders at the gates, the kitchen maids, the very beggars would stand off from me, and I, their queen, would climb the stairs alone, pass through the banquet hall, a hated thing, and seek my chambers for a hiding place, and I should find them but a sepulchre, the very rushes rotted on the floors, the fire in ashes on the freezing hearth. I was a queen, and he who loved me best made me a woman for a night and day, and now I go unqueened for evermore. A queen should never dream on summer nights, when hovering spells are heavy in the dusk. I think no night was ever quite so still, so smoothly lit with red along the west, so deeply hushed with quiet through and through, and strangely clear and sharply dyed with light. The trees stood straight against a paling sky, with Venus burning lamp-like in the west. I walked alone among a thousand flowers that drooped their heads and drowsed beneath the dew, and all my thoughts were quieted to sleep. Behind me on the walk I heard a step. I did not know my heart could tell his tread. I did not know I loved him till that hour. The garden reeled a little. I was weak, and in my breast I felt a wild, sick pain. Quickly he came behind me, caught my arms, that ached beneath his touch, and then I swayed. My head fell backward, and I saw his face. All this grows bitter that was once so sweet, and many mouths must drain the dredges of it. But none will pity me, nor pity him, whom love so lashed, and with such cruel thongs. End of Guinevere this recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Defense of Guinevere by William Morris Recording by Beth Peet On the 11th of January, 2007 At Reading, United Kingdom but, knowing now that they would have her speak, she threw her wet hair backward from her brow, her hand close to her mouth touching her cheek, as though she had had there a shameful blow, and feeling it shameful to feel aught but shame all through her heart, yet felt her cheek burn so, she must a little touch it. Like one lame, she walked away from Gawain, with her head still lifted up, and on her cheek of flame the tears dried quick. She stopped at last, and said, O oh, knights and lords, it seems but little skill to talk of well-known things past now and dead. God wot I ought to say, I have done ill, and pray you all forgiveness heartily. Because you must be right, such great lords. Still, listen. Suppose your time were come to die, and you were quite alone and very weak. Yea, laid a-dying while very mightily the wind was ruffling up the narrow streak of river, through your broad lands running well. Suppose a hush should come, then someone speak. One of these cloths is heaven, and one is hell. Now choose one cloth for ever. Which they be, I will not tell you. You must somehow tell of your own strength and mightiness. Hear, see. Yea, yea, my lord, and you to ope your eyes and at the foot of your familiar bed to see a great God's angel standing with such dyes not known on earth on his great wings, and hands held out two ways, light from the inner sky showing him well, and making his commands seem to be God's commands. Moreover, too, holding within his hands the cloths on wands, and one of these strange choosing cloths was blue, wavy, and long, and one cut short and red. No man could tell the better of the two. After a shivering half-hour, you said, God help, heaven's colour, the blue, and he said, Hell. Perhaps you would then roll upon your bed and cry to all good men that loved you well, Ah, Christ, if only I had known, known, known. Launcelot went away, then I could tell, like wisest man, how all things would be, moan and roll and hurt myself and long to die, and yet fear much to die for what was sown. Nevertheless, you, O oh Sir Gawain, lie. Whatever may have happened through these years, 
God knows I speak truth, saying that you lie. Her voice was low at first, being full of tears, but as it cleared, it grew full and loud, grow, growing a windy shriek in all men's ears, a ringing in their startled brains, until she said that Gawain had lied. Then her voice sunk, and her great eyes began again to fill. Though still she stood right up and never shrunk, but spoke on bravely, glorious lady fair. Whatever her tears, her full lips may have drunk, she stood and seemed to think, and wrung her hair, spoke out at last with no more trace of shame, with passionate twisting of her body there. It chanced upon a day that Launcelot came to dwell at Arthur's court. At Christmas time this happened, when the herald sung his name. Son of King Ban of Berwick seemed to chime along with all the bells that rang that day, or the white roofs with little change of rhyme. Christmas and whitened winter had passed away, and over me the April sunshine came, made very awful with black hail clouds. Yea, and in the summer I grew white with flame and bowed my head down. Autumn and the sick sure knowledge of things would never be the same, however often spring might be most thick of blossoms and buds, smote on me, and I grew careless of most things, let the clock tick, tick to my unhappy pulse that beat right through my eager body. While I laughed out loud and let my lips curl up at false or true, seemed cold and shallow without any cloud. Behold, my judges, then the cloths were brought. While I was dizzy thus, old thoughts were crowd, belonging to the time ere I was bought by Arthur's great name and his little love. Must I give up forever then, I thought, that which deemed would ever round me move, glorifying all things? For a little word, scarce ever meant at all, must I now prove stone cold forever? Pray you, does the Lord will that all folks should be quite happy and good? I love God now a little. If this cord were broken, once for all, what striving could make me love anything in heaven or earth? So day by day it grew, as if one should slip slowly down some path worn smooth and even, down to a cool sea on a summer day. Yet still in slipping there was some small leaven of stretched hands catching small stones by the way, until one surely reached the sea at last, and felt strange new joy as the worn head lay back, with the hair like seaweed. Yea, all past sweat of the forehead, dryness of the lips, washed utterly out by the dear waves or cast in the lone sea, far off from any ships. Do I not know now of a day in spring? No minute of that wild day ever slipped from my memory. I hear thrushes sing, and wheresoever I may be, straightway thoughts of it come up with most fresh sting. I was half mad with beauty on that day, and went without my ladies all alone, in a quiet garden walled round in every way. I was right joyful of that wall of stone, that shut the flowers and trees up with the sky, and trebled all the beauty, to the bone, yea, right through to my heart, grown very shy with weary thoughts it pierced, and made me glad, exceedingly glad, and I knew verily a little thing just then had made me mad. I dared not think, as I was wont to do sometimes, upon my beauty. If I had held up my long hand up against the blue, and, looking on the tenderly darkened fingers, thought that by rights one ought to see quite through. There, you see, where the soft still light yet lingers round by the edges. What should I have done if this had joined with the yellow-spotted singers and startling green drawn upward by the sun? And shouting, loosed out, see now, all my hair, and trancedly stood watching the west wind run with faintest half-heard breathing sound. Why, there I lose my head e'en now in doing this. But shortly listen. In that garden fair came Launcelot, walking. This is true, the kiss wherewith we kissed in meeting that spring day, I scarce dare talk of a remembered bliss, when both our mouths went wandering in one way, and aching sorely met among the leaves, our hands being left behind strained far away. Never within a yard of my bright sleeves had Launcelot come before, and now so nigh. After that day, why is it Guinevere grieves? Nevertheless, you, O oh Sir Gawain, lie. Whatever happened on through all those years, God knows I speak truth, saying that you lie.
Being such a lady, could I weep these tears if this were true? A great queen such as I, having sinned this way, straight her conscience sears, and afterwards she liveth hatefully, slaying and poisoning, Sergius never weeps. Gawain, be friends now, speak me lovingly. Do I not see how God's dear pity creeps all through your frame and trembles in your mouth? Remember in what grave your mother sleeps, buried in some place, far down in the south, men are forgetting as I speak to you. By her head severed in that awful druth of pity that drew Agravain's fell blow, I pray your pity. Let me not scream out forever after when the shrill winds blow through half your castle locks. Let me not shout forever in the winter night when you ride out alone. In battle rout, let not my rusting tears make your sword light. God of mercy, how he turns away. So ever must I dress me to the fight. So, let God's justice work. Gawain, I say, see me hew down your proofs. Yea, all men know, even as you said how Meliagrance one day, one bitter day in La Fausse guard, for all good knights, all held it afterwards, saw. Yea, sirs, by cursed unnightly outrage, through you, Gawain, held his word without a flaw. Not so, fair lords, even if the world should end this very day, and you were judges here instead of God. Did you see Melia Grants when Lancelot stood by him? What white fear curdled his blood, and how his teeth did dance, his hide sink in? As my knight cried and said, Slayer of unarmed men, here is a chance. Setter of traps, I pray you guard your head. By God, I am so glad to fight with you, stripper of ladies, that my hand feels lead for driving weight. Hurrah now, draw and do, for all my wounds are moving in my breast, and I am getting mad with waiting so. He struck his hands together o'er the beast, who fell down flat and groveled at his feet, and groaned at being slain so young. At least, my knight said, rise you, sir, who are so fleet at catching ladies. Half armed will I fight, my left side all uncovered. Then I weeped, up sprang Sir Meliagrance with great delight upon his knave's face. Not until just then did I quite hate him. As I saw my knight along the lists look to my stake and pen with such a joyous smile, it made me sigh from agony beneath my waist chain when the fight began, and to me they drew nigh. Ever Sir Launcelot kept him on the right and traversed warily, and ever high and fast leapt caitiff's sword, until my knight sudden threw up his sword to his left hand, caught it, and swung it. That was all the fight, except a spout of blood on the hot land, for it was hot as summer, and I know I wondered how the fire, while I should stand and burn against the heat, would quiver so, yards above my head. Thus these matters went which things were only warnings of the woe that fell on me. Yet Meliagrance was shent, for Meliagrance had fought against the Lord. Therefore, my lords, take heed, lest you be blunt with all his wickedness. Say no rash word against me, being so beautiful. My eyes wept all away to grey, may bring some sore to drown you in your blood. See my breast rise like waves of purple sea here as I stand and how my arms are moved in wonderful wise, yea, also at my heart's full strong command. See through my long throat how the words go up in ripples to my mouth, how in my hand the shadow lies like wine within a cup of marvellously coloured gold. Yea, now, this little wind is rising. Look you up, and wonder how the light is falling so within my moving tresses. Will you dare, when you have looked a little upon my brow, to say this thing is vile? Or will you care for any plausible lies of cunning woof, where you can see my face with no lie there forever? Am I not gracious proof? But in your chamber Launcelot was found. Is there a good knight then would stand aloof, when a queen says with gentle queenly sound, O true as steel, come now and talk with me. I love to see your step upon the ground unwavering, also well, I love to see that gracious smile light up your face, and hear your wonderful words that all mean verily the thing they seem to mean. Good friend, so dear to me in everything, come here tonight, or else the hours will pass most dull and drear. If you come not, I fear this time I might get thinking over much of times gone by, when I was young and green hope was in sight. 
For no man cares now how I sigh, and no man comes to sing me pleasant songs, nor brings me the sweet flowers that lie so thick in the gardens. Therefore one so longs to see you, Launcelot, that we may be like children once again, free from all wrongs, just for one night. Did he not come to me? What thing could keep true Launcelot away if I said, Come? There was one less than three in my quiet room that night, and we were gay. Till sudden I rose up, weak, pale, and sick, because a bawling broke our dream up. Yea, I looked at Launcelot's face and could not speak, for he looked helpless too for a little while. Then I remember how I tried to shriek, and could not but fell down. From tile to tile the stones they threw up rattled over my head and made me dizzier, till within a while my maids were all about me, and my head on Launcelot's breast was being soothed away from its white chattering until Launcelot said, By God, I will not tell you more today. Judge any way you will. What matters it? You know quite well the story of that fray. How Launcelot stilled their bawling, the mad fit that caught up Gawain, all, all, verily. But just that which would save me, these things flit. Nevertheless, you, O oh, Sir Gawain, lie. Whatever may have happened these long years, God knows I speak truth, saying that you lie. All I have said is truth by Christ's dear tears. She would not speak another word, but stood turned sideways, listening like a man who hears his brother's trumpet sounding through the wood of his foe's lances. She leaned eagerly and gave a slight spring sometimes, as she could at last hear something really. Joyfully, her cheek grew crimson as the headlong speed of the roan charger drew all men to see. The knight who came was Launcelot at good need. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Lundeen, Chicago, Illinois. Chapter 15. The Round Table. From The King Arthur and His Knights section of The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch. The famous enchanter Merlin had exerted all his skill in fabricating the round table. Of the seats which surrounded it, he had constructed thirteen, in memory of the thirteen apostles. Twelve of these seats only could be occupied, and they only by knights of the highest fame. The thirteenth represented the seat of the traitor Judas. It remained always empty. It was called the perilous seat, ever since a rash and haughty Saracen knight had dared to place himself in it when the earth opened and swallowed him up. In our great hall there stood a vacant chair, fashioned by Merlin ere he passed away, and carven with strange figures, and in and out the figures, like a serpent, ran a scroll of letters in a tongue no man could read. And Merlin called it the Siege Perilous, perilous for good and ill. For there, he said, no man could sit, but he should lose himself. The Holy Grail A magic power wrote upon each seat the name of the knight who was entitled to sit in it. No one could succeed to a vacant seat unless he surpassed in valor and glorious deeds the knight who had occupied it before him. Without this qualification, he would be violently repelled by a hidden force. Thus proof was made of all those who presented themselves to replace any companions of the order who had fallen. One of the principal seats, that of Marant of Ireland, had been vacant ten years, and his name still remained over it ever since the time when that distinguished champion fell beneath the sword of Sir Tristram. Arthur now took Tristram by the hand and led him to that seat. 
Immediately, the most melodious sounds were heard, and exquisite perfumes filled the place. The name of Morant disappeared, and that of Tristram blazed forth in light. The rare modesty of Tristram had now to be subjected to a severe task, for the clerks, charged with the duty of preserving the annals of the round table, attended, and he was required by the law of his order to declare what feats of arms he had accomplished to entitle him to take that seat. This ceremony being ended, Tristram received the congratulations of all his companions. Sir Lancelot and Guinevere took the occasion to speak to him of the fair Isote, and to express their wish that some happy chance might bring her to the kingdom of Loegria. While Tristram was thus honored and caressed at the court of King Arthur, the most gloomy and malignant jealousy harassed the soul of Mark. He could not look upon Isolt without remembering that she loved Tristram, and the good fortune of his nephew goaded him to thoughts of vengeance. He at last resolved to go disguised into the kingdom of Loegria, attack Tristram by stealth, and put him to death. He took with him two knights brought up in his court, who he thought were devoted to him, and not willing to leave Isolde behind, named two of her maidens to attend her, together with her faithful Brangwain, and made them accompany him. Having arrived in the neighborhood of Camelot, Mark imparted his plan to his two knights, but they rejected it with horror. Nay, more, they declared that they would no longer remain in his service, and left him, giving him reason to suppose that they should repair to the court to accuse him before Arthur. It was necessary for Mark to meet and rebut their accusation, so leaving Isolde in an abbey, he pursued his way alone to Camelot. Mark had not ridden far when he encountered a party of knights of Arthur's court, and would have avoided them, for he knew their habit of challenging to adjust every stranger knight whom they met. But it was too late. They had seen his armor and recognized him as a Cornish knight, and at once resolved to have some sport with him. It happened they had with them Dagwinet, King Arthur's fool, who, though deformed and weak of body, was not wanting in courage. The knights, as Mark approached, laid their plan that Dagwinet should personate Sir Lancelot of the Lake and challenge the Cornish knight. They equipped him in armor belonging to one of their number who was ill and sent him forward to the crossroad to defy the strange knight. Mark, who saw that his antagonist was by no means formidable in appearance, was not disinclined to the combat, but when the dwarf rode towards him, calling out that he was Sir Lancelot of the Lake, his fears prevailed. He put spurs to his horse and rode away at full speed, pursued by the shouts and laughter of the party. Meanwhile, Isolde, remaining at the abbey with her faithful Brengwain, found her only amusement in walking occasionally in a forest adjoining the abbey. There, on the brink of a fountain girdled with trees, she thought of her love and sometimes joined her voice and her harp in lays reviving the memory of its pains or pleasures. One day, the caitiff knight, Breus the Pitiless, heard her voice, concealed himself, and drew near. She sang, Sweet silence, shadowy bower, and verdant lair, ye court my troubled spirit to repose, whilst I such dear remembrance rises there, Awaken every echo with my woes. Within these woods, by nature's hand arrayed, A fountain springs and feeds a thousand flowers. Ah, how my groans do all its murmurs aid! How my sad eyes do swell it with their showers! What doth my knight the while? To him is given a double meed, In love and arms reprise, him the round table elevates to heaven. Tristram, ah me, he hears not Isolde's cries. Breus the Pitiless, who, like most other caitiffs, had felt the weight of Tristram's arms and hated him accordingly, at hearing his name breathed forth by the beautiful songstress, impelled by a double impulse, 
rushed forth from his concealment and laid hands on his victim. Isolde fainted, and Brengwain filled the air with her shrieks. Brius carried Isolde to the place where he had left his horse, but the animal had got away from his bridle and was at some distance. He was obliged to lay down his fair burden and go in pursuit of his horse. Just then, a knight came up, drawn by the cries of Brengwain, and demanded the cause of her distress. She could not speak, but pointed to her mistress lying insensible on the ground. Brius had by this time returned, and the cries of Brengwain, renewed at seeing him, sufficiently showed the stranger the cause of the distress. Tristam spurred his horse toward Brius, who, not unprepared, ran to the encounter. Brius was unhorsed and lay motionless, pretending to be dead. But when the stranger knight left him to attend to the distressed damsels, he mounted his horse and made his escape. The knight, now approached Isolt, gently raised her head, drew aside the golden hair which covered her countenance, and gazed thereon for an instant, uttered a cry, and fell back, insensible. Brengwain came. Her cares soon restored her mistress to life, and they then turned their attention to the fallen warrior. They raised his visor and discovered the countenance of Sir Tristram. Isolde threw herself on the body of her lover and bedewed his face with her tears. Their warmth revived the night, and Tristram, on awakening, found himself in the arms of his dear Isolde. It was the law of the round table that each night after his admission should pass the next ten days in quest of adventures, during which time his companions might meet him in disguised armor and try their strength with him. Tristram had now been out seven days, and in that time had encountered many of the best knights of the round table, and acquitted himself with honor. During the remaining three days, Isolde remained at the abbey under his protection, and then set out with her maidens, escorted by Sir Tristram, to rejoin King Mark at the court of Camelot. This happy journey was one of the brightest epochs in the lives of Tristram and Isolde. He celebrated it by a lay upon the harp in a peculiar measure, to which the French give him the name of Triolet. With fair Isolde and with love, ah, how sweet the life I lead! How blessed forever thus to rove, with fair Isolde and with love, as she wills, I live and move, and cloudless days to days succeed, with fair Isolde and with love, ah, how sweet the life I lead! Journeying on from break of day, feel you not fatigued, my fair? Yon green turf invites to play. Journeying on from day to day, ah, let us to that shade away, were it but to slumber there. Journeying on from break of day, feel you not fatigued, my fair? They arrived at Camelot, where Sir Lancelot received them most cordially. Isolde was introduced to King Arthur, and Queen Guinevere, who welcomed her as a sister. As King Mark was held in arrest under the accusation of the two Cornish knights, Queen Isolde could not rejoin her husband, and Sir Lancelot placed his castle of La Joyeuse Garde at the disposal of his friends, who there took up their abode. King Mark, who found himself obliged to confess the truth of the charge against him, or to clear himself by combat with his accusers, performed the former, and King Arthur, as his crime had not been perpetrated, remitted the penalty, only enjoining upon him, under pain of his signal displeasure, to lay aside all thoughts of vengeance against his nephew. In the presence of the king and his court, all parties were formally reconciled. Mark and his queen departed for their home, and Tristram remained at Arthur's court. End of story. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. This is an excerpt from Idols of the King by Alfred Lord Tennyson, entitled Merlin and Vivian. A storm was coming, but the winds were still, and in the wild woods of Brosiliand, before an oak so hollow, huge, and old, it looked a tower of ivied mason work. At Merlin's feet the wily Vivian lay. For he that always bare in bitter grudge the slights of Arthur and his table, Mark, the Cornish king, had heard a wandering voice. A minstrel of Carleon by strong storm blown into shelter at Tintagel, say that out of naked knight-like purity Sir Lancelot worshipped no unmarried girl but the great queen herself, fought in her name, swear by her, vows like theirs, that high in heaven love most, but neither marry, nor are given in marriage, angels of our Lord's report. He ceased, and then, for Vivian sweetly said, she sat beside the banquet nearest Mark, And is the fair example followed, sir, in Arthur's household? answered innocently. I, by some few, I truly, use that hold it more beseems the perfect virgin knight to worship woman as true wife beyond all hopes of gaining than his maiden girl. They place their pride in Lancelot and the queen, so passionate for an utter purity, beyond the limit of their bond are these, for Arthur bound them not to singleness, brave hearts and clean, and yet, God guide them, young. Then Mark was half in heart to hurl his cup straight at the speaker, but forbore. He rose to leave the hall, and, Vivian following him, turned to her. Here are snakes within the grass, and you methinks, O Vivian, save ye fear the monkish manhood, and the mask of pure worn by this court, can stir them till they sting. And Vivian answered, smiling scornfully, why fear, because that fostered at thy court I savour of thy virtues? Fear them? No. As love, if love is perfect, cast out fear, so hate, if hate is perfect, cast out fear. My father died in battle against the king, my mother on his corpse in open field. She bore me there, for born from death was I, among the dead and sown upon the wind, and then on thee, and shown the truth betimes, that old true filth, and bottom of the well where truth is hidden, gracious lessons thine, and maxims of the mud. This Arthur pure, great nature through the flesh herself hath made, gives him the lie. There is no being pure, my cherub, saith not holy writ the same? If I were Arthur, I would have thy blood, thy blessing, stainless king, I bring thee back, when I have ferreted out their burrowings, the hearts of all this order in mine hand. I, so that fate and craft and folly close, perchance, one curl of Arthur's golden beard. To me this narrow grizzled fork of thine is cleaner fashioned. Well, I love thee first, that warps the wit. Loud laughed the graceless Mark, but Vivian, into Camelot stealing, lodged low in the city, and on a festal day when Guinevere was crossing the great hall, cast herself down, knelt to the queen, and wailed. Why kneel ye there? What evil hath ye wrought? Rise! And the damsel bidden rise arose, and stood with folded hands and downward eyes of glancing corner, and all meekly said, None wrought, but suffered much, an orphan maid. My father died in battle for thy king, my mother on his corpse in open field, the sad, sea-sounding wastes of Leoness. Poor wretch, no friend, and now by Mark the king, for that small charm of feature mine, pursued. If any such be mine, I fly to thee. Save, save me thou! woman of women, thine the wreath of beauty, thine the crown of power, 
be thine the balm of pity o oh, heaven's own white earth angel stainless bride of stainless king help for he follows take me to thyself oh yield me shelter for mine innocency among thy maidens here her slow sweet eyes fear tremulous but humbly hopeful rose fixed on her hearers while the queen who stood all glittering like may sunshine on may leaves in green and gold and plumed with green replied peace child of over praise and over blame we choose the last our noble arthur him ye scarce can over praise will hear and know nay we believe all evil of thy mark well we shall test thee farther but this hour we ride a-hawking with sir lancelot he hath given us a fair falcon which he trained we go to prove it bide ye here the while she passed and vivian murmured after go i bide the while then through the portal arch peering askance and muttering broken wise as one that labours with an evil dream beheld the queen and lancelot get to horse is that the lancelot goodly ay but gaunt courteous amends for gauntness takes her hand that glance of theirs but for the street had been a clinging kiss how hand lingers in hand let go at last they ride away to hawk for waterfowl royaler game is mine for such a supersensual sensual bond as that great cricket chirped of at our hearth touch flax with flame a glance will serve the liars ah little rat that borest in the dyke thy hole by night to let the boundless deep down upon far-off cities while they dance or dream of thee they dreamed not nor of me <laughs> these i but each of either ride and dream the mortal dream that never yet was mine ride ride and dream until ye wake to me then narrow court and lubber king farewell for lancelot will be gracious to the rat and our wise queen if knowing that i know will hate loathe fear but honour me the more yet while they rode together down the plain their talk was all of training terms of art diet and sealing jesses leash and lure she is too noble he said to check it pies nor will she rake there is no baseness in her here when the queen demanded as by chance know ye the stranger woman let her be said lancelot and unhooded casting off the goodly falcon free she towered her bells tone under tone shrilled and they lifted up their eager faces wondering at the strength boldness and royal knighthood of the bird who pounced her quarry and slew it many a time as once of old among the flowers they rode but vivian half forgotten of the queen among her damsels broidering sat heard watched and whispered through the peaceful court she crept and whispered then as arthur in the highest leavened the world so vivian in the lowest arriving at a time of golden rest and sowing one ill hint from ear to ear while all the heathen lay at arthur's feet and no quest came but all was joust in play leavened his hall they heard and let her be thereafter as an enemy that has left death in the living waters and withdrawn the wily vivian stole from arthur's court she hated all the knights and heard in thought their lavish comment when her name was named for once when arthur walking all alone vexed at a rumour issued from herself of some corruption crept among his knights had met her vivian being greeted fair 
would fain have wrought upon his cloudy mood with reverent eyes mock-loyal, shaken voice, and fluttered adoration, and at last with dark sweet hints of some who prized him more than who should prize him most, at which the king had gazed upon her blankly and gone by. But one had watched, and had not held his peace. It made the laughter of an afternoon that Vivian should attempt the blameless king. And after that she set herself to gain him, the most famous man of all those times, Merlin, who knew the range of all their arts, had built the king his havens, ships, and halls, was also barred, and knew the starry heavens. The people called him wizard whom at first she played about with slight and sprightly talk, and vivid smiles, and faintly venomed points of slander, glancing here and grazing there, and, yielding to his kindlier moods, the seer would watch her at her petulance, and play, even when they seemed unlovable, and laugh as those that watch a kitten. Thus he grew tolerant of what he half disdained, and she, perceiving that she was but half disdained, began to break her sports with graver fits, turn red or pale, would often when they met sigh fully, or all silent gaze upon him with such a fixed devotion that the old man, though doubtful, felt the flattery and at times would flatter his own wish in age for love, and half believe her true. For thus at times he wavered, and that other clung to him, fixed in her will, and so the seasons went. Then fell on Merlin a great melancholy. He walked with dreams and darkness, and he found a doom that ever poised itself to fall, an ever moaning battle in the mist, world war of dying flesh against the life, death in all life, and lying in all love, the meanest having power upon the highest, and the high purpose broken by the worm. So leaving Arthur's court he gained the beach, there found a little boat, and stepped into it. And Vivian followed, but he marked her not. She took the helm, and he the sail. The boat drave with a sudden wind across the deeps, and touching Breton sands they disembarked. And then she followed Merlin all the way, even to the wild woods of Broceliand. For Merlin once had told her of a charm, the which, if any wrought on any one, with woven paces and with waving arms, the man so wrought on ever seemed to lie closed in the four walls of a hollow tower from which there was no escape for evermore, and none could find that man for evermore, nor could he see but him who wrought the charm coming and going, and he lay as dead and lost to life and use and name and fame. And Vivian ever sought to work the charm upon the great enchanter of the time, as fancying that her glory would be great according to his greatness whom she quenched. There lay she all her length, and kissed his feet, as if in deepest reverence and in love. A twist of gold was round her hair, a robe of Samite without price, that more expressed than hid her, clung about her lissom limbs, in colour like the satin shining palm on sallows and the windy gleams of March and while she kissed them, crying, Trample me, dear feet, that I have followed through the world, and I will pay you worship. Tread me down, and I will kiss you for it. He was mute. So dark a forethought rolled about his brain, as on a dull day, in an ocean cave, the blind wave feeling round his long sea hall in silence. Wherefore, when she lifted up a face of sad appeal, and spake and said, O oh, Merlin, do ye love me? And again, O oh, Merlin, do ye love me? And once more, Great master, do you love me? He was mute. And lissom Vivian, 
holding by his heel, writhed toward him, sliding up his knee, and sat, behind his ankle twined her hollow feet together, curved an arm about his neck, clung like a snake, and letting her left hand droop from his mighty shoulder as a leaf, made with her right a comb of pearl to part the lists of such a beard as youth gone out had left in ashes. Then he spoke and said, not looking at her, who are wise in love, love most, say least. And Vivian answered quick, I saw the little elf-god Eilis once, in Arthur's heiress hall at Camelot, but neither eyes nor tongue. O oh, stupid child! Yet you are wise who say it. Let me think silence is wisdom. I am silent, then, and ask no kiss. Then, adding all at once, and lo, I clothe myself with wisdom, drew the vast and shaggy mantle of his beard across her neck and bosom to her knee, and called herself a gilded summer fly caught in a great old tyrant spider's web, who meant to eat her up in that wild wood without one word. So Vivian called herself, but rather seemed a lovely baleful star veiled in grey vapour, till he sadly smiled. To what request, for what strange boon, he said, are these your pretty tricks and fooleries, O Vivian, the preamble? Yet my thanks, for these have broken up my melancholy. And Vivian answered, smiling saucily, What, O my master, have ye found your voice? I bid the stranger welcome. Thanks at last! But yesterday you never opened lip, except indeed to drink. No cup had we. In mine own lady palms I culled the spring that gathered trickling dropwise from the cleft, and made a pretty cup of both my hands, and offered you it kneeling. Then you drank, and knew no more, nor gave me one poor word. Oh, no more thanks than might a goat have given, with no more sign of reverence than a beard. And when we halted at that other well, and I was faint to swooning, and you lay foot-gilt with all the blossom-dust of those deep meadows we had traversed, did you know that Vivian bathed your feet before her own? And yet no thanks! And all through this wild wood, and all this morning, when I fondled you, boon, ay, there was a boon, one not so strange. How had I wronged you? Surely ye are wise, but such a silence is more wise than kind. And Merlin locked his hand in hers, and said, Oh, did ye never lie upon the shore, and watch the curled white of the coming wave glassed in the slippery sand before it breaks? Even such a wave, but not so pleasurable, dark in the glass of some presageful mood, had I for three days seen, ready to fall. And then I rose and fled from Arthur's court to break the mood. You followed me unasked. And when I looked and saw you following me still, my mind involved yourself the nearest thing in that mind missed. For shall I tell you truth? You seem that wave about to break upon me, and sweep me from my hold upon the world my use and name and fame. Your pardon, child, your pretty sports have brightened me all again. And ask your boon, for boon I owe you thrice, once for wrong done you by confusion, next for thanks it seems till now neglected, last for these your dainty gambols. Wherefore ask, and take this boon so strange and not so strange. And Vivian answered, smiling mournfully, Oh, not so strange as my long asking it, yet not so strange as you yourself are strange, nor half so strange as that dark mood of yours. I ever feared ye were not wholly mine, and see, yourself having owned ye did me wrong. The people call you prophet, let it be, but not of those that can expound themselves. Take Vivian for expounder, 
she will call that three days long presageful gloom of yours no presage but the same mistrustful mood that makes you seem less noble than yourself whenever i have asked this very boon now asked again for see you not, dear love, that such a mood as that which lately gloomed your fancy when you saw me following you, must make me fear still more that you are not mine, must make me yearn still more to prove you mine, and make me wish still more to learn this charm of woven paces and of waving hands as proof of trust. O oh, Merlin, teach it me. The charm so taught will charm us both to rest for grant me some slight power upon your fate i feeling that you felt me worthy trust should rest and let you rest knowing you mine and therefore be as great as ye are named not muffled round with selfish reticence how hard you look and how denyingly oh if you think this wickedness in me that i should prove it on you unawares that makes me passing wrathful then our bond had best be loosed for ever. But think or not, by heaven that hears, I tell you the clean truth, as clean as blood of babes, or white as milk. O oh, Merlin, may this earth, if ever I, if these unwitty, wandering wits of mine, even in the jumbled rubbish of a dream, have tripped upon such conjectural treachery, May this hard earth cleave to the nadir hell, down, down, and close again, and nip me flat, if I be such a traitress. Yield my boon, to which I scarce can yield you all I am, and grant my reiterated wish, the great proof of your love, because I think, however wise, ye hardly know me yet and Merlin loosed his hand from hers, and said, I never was less wise, however wise, too curious, Vivian, though you talk of trust, than when I told you first of such a charm. Yea, if ye talk of trust, I tell you this, too much I trusted when I told you that, and stirred this vice in you which ruined man through woman the first hour. For howsoe'er in children a great curiousness be well, Who have to learn themselves and all the world, In you that are no child, For still I find your face is practised when I spell the lines. I call it, well, I will not call it vice. But since you name yourself the summer fly, I well could wish a cobweb for the gnat, That settles, beaten back, and beaten back, settles, till one could yield for weariness. But since I will not yield to give you power upon my life and use and name and fame, why will ye never ask some other boon? Yea, by God's rood, I trusted you too much. And Vivian, like the tenderest-hearted maid that ever bided tryst at village style, made answer, either eyelid wet with tears. Nay, master, be not wrathful with your maid. Caress her. Let her feel herself forgiven, who feels no heart to ask another boon. I think ye hardly know the tender rhyme of Trust me not at all, or all in all. I heard the great Sir Lancelot sing it once, and it shall answer for me. Listen to it. In love, if love be love, if love be ours, Faith and unfaith can ne'er be equal powers, Unfaith in aught is want of faith in all. It is the little rift within the lute, That by and by will make the music mute, And ever widening slowly silence all. The little rift within the lover's lute, Or little pitted speck in garnered fruit, that rotting inward slowly moulders all. It is not worth the keeping, let it go. But shall it? Answer, darling, answer, no. And trust me not at all, or all in all. O oh, master, do you love my tender rhyme? And Merlin looked, and half believed her true, 
so tender was her voice, so fair her face, so sweetly gleamed her eyes behind her tears, like sunlight on the plain behind a shower. And yet he answered half indignantly, Far other was the song that once I heard by this huge oak, sung nearly where we sit, for here we met, some ten or twelve of us, to chase a creature that was current then in these wild woods, the heart with golden horns. It was the time when first the question rose about the founding of a table round, that was to be, for love of God and men and noble deeds, the flower of all the world. And each incited each to noble deeds, and while we waited one, the youngest of us, we could not keep him silent. Out he flashed, and into such a song, such fire for fame, such trumpet glowings in it, coming down to such a stern and iron-clashing close, that when he stopped we longed to hurl together, and should have done it, but the beauteous beast, scared by the noise, upstarted at our feet, and like a silver shadow slipped away through the dim land, and all day long we rode through the dim land against a rushing wind, that glorious roundel echoing in our ears, and chased the flashes of his golden horns till they vanished by the fairy well that laughs at iron, as our warriors did, where children cast their pins and nails and cry, Laugh, little well, but touch it with a sword. It buzzes fiercely round the point, and there we lost him. Such a noble song was that. But, Vivian, when you sang me that sweet rhyme, I felt as though you knew this cursed charm, were proving it on me, and that I lay and felt them slowly ebbing, name and fame. And Vivian answered, smiling mournfully, O oh, mine have ebbed away for evermore, and all through following you to this wild wood, because I saw you sad, to comfort you. Lo now, what hearts have men! They never mount as high as woman in her selfless mood. And touching fame, howe'er ye scorn my song, take one verse more. The lady speaks it, this. My name, once mine, now thine, is closelier mine. For fame, could fame be mine, that fame were thine. And shame, could shame be thine, that shame were mine. So trust me not at all, or all in all. Says she not well? And there is more. This rhyme is like the fair pearl necklace of the queen that burst in dancing, and the pearls were spilt, some lost, some stolen, some as relics kept. But never more the same two sister pearls ran down the silken thread to kiss each other on her white neck. So is it with this rhyme. It lives dispersedly in many hands, and every minstrel sings it differently. Yet there is one true line, the pearl of pearls. Man dreams of fame, while woman wakes to love. Yea, love, though love were of the grossest, carves a portion from the solid present, eats and uses, careless of the rest, but fame. The fame that follows death is nothing to us, and what is fame in life but half disfame, and counterchanged with darkness? Ye yourself know well that envy calls you devil's son, and since ye seem the master of all art, they fain would make you master of all vice. End of part one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. This is an excerpt from Idols of the King by Alfred Lord Tennyson entitled Merlin and Vivian. This is part two. 
and Merlin locked his hand in hers, and said, I once was looking for a magic weed, and found a fair young squire who sat alone, had carved himself a knightly shield of wood, and then was painting on it fancied arms, azure, an eagle rising oar, the sun in Dexter chief, the scroll, I follow fame. And, speaking not, but leaning over him, I took his brush and blotted out the bird, and made a gardener putting in a graph, with this for motto, rather use than fame. You should have seen him blush, but afterwards he made a stalwart knight. O oh, Vivian, for you, methinks you think you love me well, for me, I love you somewhat, rest. And love should have some rest and pleasure in himself, not ever be too curious for a boon, too prurient for a proof against the grain of him ye say ye love. But fame with men, being but ampler means to serve mankind, should have small rest or pleasure in herself, but work as vassal to the larger love that dwarfs the petty love of one to one. Use gave me fame at first and fame again increasing gave me use. Lo, there my boon! What other? For men sought to prove me vile, because I fain had given them greater wits. And then did envy call me devil's son, the sick weak beast seeking to help herself by striking at her better, missed, and brought her own claw back and wounded her own heart. Sweet were the days when I was all unknown, but when my name was lifted up, the storm brake on the mountain, and I cared not for it. Right well know I that fame is half disfame, yet needs must work my work. That other fame, to one at least, who hath not children, vague, the cackle of the unborn about the grave, I cared not for it a single misty star, which is the second in a line of stars that seem a sword beneath a belt of three. I never gazed upon it, but I dreamt of some vast charm concluded in that star to make fame nothing. Wherefore, if I fear, giving you power upon me through this charm, that you might play me falsely having power, however well ye think you love me now, as sons of kings loving in pupilage have turned to tyrants when they came to power. I rather dread the loss of use than fame. If you, and not so much from wickedness, as some wild turn of anger, or a mood of overstrained affection, it may be, to keep me all to your own self, or else a sudden spurt of woman's jealousy, should try this charm on whom ye say ye love. And Vivian answered, smiling as in wrath, Have I not sworn? I am not trusted. Good. Well, hide it. Hide it. I shall find it out. And being found, take heed of Vivian. A woman and not trusted. Doubtless I might feel some sudden turn of anger born of your misfaith. And your fine epithet is accurate too. For this full love of mine without the full heart back, may merit well your term of overstrained. So used as I, my daily wonder is, I love it all. And as to woman's jealousy, oh, why not? Oh, to what end except a jealous one, and one to make me jealous if I love, were this fair charm invented by yourself? I well believe that all about this world ye cage a buxom captive here and there, closed in the four walls of a hollow tower from which there is no escape for evermore. Then the great master merrily answered her, <laughs> Full many a love and loving youth was mine. I needed then no charm to keep them mine, but youth and love. And that full heart of yours whereof ye prattle may now assure you mine. So live uncharmed, for those who wrought it first, the wrist is parted from the hand that waved, the feet unmortised from their ankle-bones who paced it ages back. But will ye hear the legend as in Gerdon for your rhyme? 
there lived a king in the most eastern east, less old than I, yet older, for my blood hath earnest in it of far springs to be. A tawny pirate anchored in his port, whose bark had plundered twenty nameless isles. And passing one, at the high peep of dawn, he saw two cities in a thousand boats, all fighting for a woman on the sea. And pushing his black craft among them all, he lightly scattered theirs, and brought her off, with loss of half his people arrows slain. A maid so smooth, so white, so wonderful, they said a light came from her when she moved. And since the pirate would not yield her up, the king impaled him for his piracy, then made her queen. But those isle-nurtured eyes waged such unwilling though successful war on all the youth. They sickened, councils thinned, and armies waned, for magnet light she drew the rustiest iron of old fighters' hearts, and beasts themselves would worship. Camels knelt unbidden, and the brutes of mountain back that carry kings and castles bowed black knees of homage, ringing with their serpent hands to make her smile her golden ankle-bells. What wonder being jealous that he sent his horns of proclamation out through all the hundred under kingdoms that he swayed, to find a wizard who might teach the king some charm, which being wrought upon the queen might keep her all his own. To such a one he promised more than ever king has given, a league of mountain full of golden mines, a province with a hundred miles of coast, a palace and a princess, all for him. But on all who tried and failed, the king pronounced a dismal sentence, meaning by it to keep the list low and pretenders back, or, like a king, not to be trifled with. Their heads should moulder on the city gates. And many tried and failed, because the charm of nature in her overbore their own. And many a wizard brow bleached on the walls, and many weeks of troop of carrion crows hung like a cloud above the gateway towers. And Vivian, breaking in upon him, said, I sit and gather honey, yet, methinks, thy tongue is tripped a little. Ask thyself. The lady never made unwilling war with those fine eyes. She had her pleasure in it, and made her good man jealous with good cause, and lived there neither dame nor damsel then, wroth at a lover's loss? Were all as tame, I mean, as noble, as the queen was fair? Not one to flirt a venom at her eyes, or pinch a murderous dust into her drink, or make her paler with a poisoned rose? Well, those were not our days. But did they find a wizard? Tell me. Was he like to thee?" She ceased and made her lithe arm round his neck tighten, and then drew back, and let her eyes speak for her, glowing on him, like a bride's on her new lord, her own, the first of men. He answered, laughing, <laughs> Nay, not like to me. At last they found, his foragers for charms, a little glassy-headed, hairless man, who lived alone in a great wild on grass, read but one book, and ever reading grew so grated down and filed away with thought, so lean his eyes were monstrous, while the skin clung but to crate and basket, ribs and spine. And since he kept his mind on one sole aim, nor ever touched fierce wine, nor tasted flesh, nor owned a sensual wish, to him the wall that sunders ghosts and shadow-casting men became a crystal, and he saw them through it, and heard their voices talk behind the wall, and learnt their elemental secrets, powers, and forces. Often o'er the sun's bright eye drew the vast eyelid of an inky cloud, and lashed it at the base with slanting storm, or in the noon of mist and driving rain, when the lake whitened and the pine-wood roared, and the carned mountain was a shadow, sunned the world to peace again. Here was the man. And so by force they dragged him to the king. 
and then he taught the king to charm the queen in such wise that no man could see her more nor saw she save the king who wrought the charm coming and going and she lay as dead and lost all use of life but when the king made proffer of the league of golden mines the province with a hundred miles of coast the palace and the princess that old man went back to his old wild and lived on grass and vanished and his book came down to me and vivian answered smiling saucily ye have the book the charm is written in it good take my counsel let me know it at once for keep it like a puzzle chest in chest with each chest locked and padlocked thirtyfold and whelm all this beneath as vast a mound as after furious battle turfs the slain on some wild down above the windy deep i yet should strike upon a sudden means to dig pick open find and read the charm then if i tried it who should blame me then and smiling as a master smiles on one that is not of his school nor any school but that where blind and naked ignorance delivers brawling judgments unashamed on all things all day long he answered her thou read the book my pretty vivian oh ay it is but twenty pages long but every page having an ample marge and every marge enclosing in the midst a square of text that seems a little blot the text no larger than the limbs of fleas and every square of text an awful charm writ in a language that has long gone by so long that mountains have arisen since with cities on their flanks thou read the book and ever margin scribbled crossed and crammed with comment densest condensation hard to mine and die but the long sleepless nights of my long life have made it easy to me and none can read the text not even i and none can read the comment but myself and in the comment did i find the charm oh the results are simple a mere child might use it to the harm of any one and never could undo it ask no more for though ye should not prove it upon me but keep that oath ye swear ye might perchance assay it on some one of the table round and all because ye dream they babble of you and vivian frowning in true anger said what dare the full-fed liars say of me they write abroad redressing human wrongs they sit with knife in meat and wine in horn they bound to holy vows of chastity were i not woman i could tell a tale but you are man you well can understand the shame that cannot be explained for shame not one of all the drove should touch me swine then answered merlin careless of her words you breathe but accusation vast and vague spleen-born i think and proofless if ye know set up the charge ye know to stand or fall and vivian answered frowning wrathfully oh ay what say ye to surveillance him whose kinsman left him watcher o'er his wife and two fair babes and went to distant lands was one year gone and on returning found not two but three there lay the reckling one but one hour old what said the happy sire a seven months babe had been a truer gift those twelve sweet moons confused his fatherhood then answered merlin nay i know the tale surveillance wedded with an outland dame some cause had kept him sundered from his wife one child they had it lived with her she died her kinsman travelling on his own affair was charged by valence to bring home the child he brought not found it therefore take the truth oh i said vivian over true a tale what say ye then to sweet sir sagramore that ardent man to pluck the flower in season so says the song i trow it is no treason 
Oh, master, shall we call him over quick to crop his own sweet rose before the hour? And Merlin answered, Over quick art thou to catch a loathly plume fallen from the wing of that foul bird of rapine whose whole prey is man's good name. He never wronged his bride. I know the tale. An angry gust of wind puffed out his torch among the myriad roomed and many corridored complexities of Arthur's palace. Then he found a door, and Darkling felt the sculptured ornament that wreath and wound it made it seem his own. And wearied out, made for the couch and slept, a stainless man beside a stainless maid, and either slept nor knew of other there till the high dawn piercing the royal rose in Arthur's casement glimmered chastely down, blushing upon them blushing, and at once he rose without a word and parted from her. But when the thing was blazed about the court, the brute world howling forced them into bonds. And as it chanced, they are happy, being pure. "'Oh, I,' said Vivian, "'that were likely, too.' What say ye then to fair Sir Percival, of the horrid foulness that he wrought, the saintly youth, the spotless Lamb of Christ, or some black weather of Saint Satan's fold? What, in the precincts of the chapel-yard, among the knightly brasses of the graves, and by the cold hick jassets of the dead? And Merlin answered careless of her charge. A sober man is Percival, and pure but once in life was flustered with new wine, then paced for coolness in the chapel-yard, where one of Satan's shepherdesses caught and meant to stamp him with her master's mark. And that he sinned is not believable, for look upon his face. But if he sinned, the sin that practice burns into the blood, and not the one dark hour which brings remorse, will brand us after, of whose fold we be or else were he the holy king whose hymns are chanted in the minster worse than all. But is your spleen frothed out, or have ye more? And Vivian answered frowning, yet in wrath, O oh, I, what say ye to Sir Lancelot, friend, traitor, or true? That commerce with the queen, I ask you, is it clamoured by the child, or whispered in the corner? Do ye know it? To which he answered sadly, Yea, I know it. Sir Lancelot went ambassador at first to fetch her, and she watched him from her walls. A rumour runs she took him for the king, so fixed her fancy on him. Let them be. But have ye no one word of loyal praise for Arthur, blameless king and stainless man? She answered with a low and chuckling laugh. Man, is he man at all, who knows and winks? Sees what his fair bride is, and does, and winks? By which the good king means to blind himself, and blinds himself and all the table round, to all the foulness that they work. Myself could call him, were it not for womanhood, the pretty popular cause such manhood earns, could call him the main cause of all their crime. Yea, were he not crowned king, coward and fool. Then Merlin to his own heart loathing said, O oh, true and tender, O oh, my liege and king, O oh, selfless man and stainless gentleman, who wouldst against thine own eye-witness fain have all men true and leal, all women pure. How, in the mouths of base interpreters, from over-fineness not intelligible to things with every sense, as false and foul as the poached filth that floods the middle street, is thy white blamelessness accounted blame. But Vivian, deeming Merlin overborne by instance, recommenced, and let her tongue rage like a fire among the noblest names, polluting and imputing her whole self, defaming and defacing, till she left not even Lancelot brave, nor Galahad clean. Her words had issue other than she willed. 
he dragged his eyebrow bushes down, and made a snowy penthouse for his hollow eyes, and muttered in himself, Tell her the charm. So, if she had it, would she rail on me to snare the next, and if she have it not, so will she rail. What did the wanton say? Not mount as high. We scarce can sink as low, for men at most differ as heaven and earth, but women, worst and best, as heaven and hell. I know the table round, my friends of old, all brave, and many generous, and some chaste. She cloaks the scar of some repulse with lies. I will believe she tempted them and failed. Being so bitter, for fine plots may fail, though harlots paint their talk as well as face with colours of the heart that are not theirs. I will not let her know. Nine tithes of times face flatterer and backbiter are the same, and they, sweet soul, that most impute a crime are pronest to it, and impute themselves, wanting the mental range. Or low desire not to feel lowest makes them level all. Yea, they would pair the mountain to the plain, to leave an equal baseness, and in this are harlots like the crowd, that if they find some stain or blemish in a name of note, not grieving that their greatest are so small, inflate themselves with some insane delight, and judge all nature from her feet of clay, without the will to lift their eyes and see her godlike head crowned with spiritual fire, and touching other worlds. I am weary of her. He spoke in words part heard, in whispers part, half suffocated in the hoary fell, and many wintered fleece of throat and chin. But Vivian, gathering somewhat of his mood, and hearing Harlot muttered twice or thrice, leaped from her session on his lap, and stood stiff as a viper frozen, loathsome sight, how from the rosy lips of life and love flashed the bare-grinning skeleton of death. White was her cheek. Sharp breaths of anger puffed her fairy nostril out. Her hand half clenched went faltering sideways down to her belt, and feeling, had she found a dagger there, for in a wink the false love turns to hate, she would have stabbed him, but she found it not. His eye was calm, and suddenly she took to bitter weeping like a beaten child, a long, long weeping, not consolable. Then her false voice made way, broken with sobs. Oh, crueler than ever was told in tale, or sung in song! Oh, vainly lavished love! Oh, cruel! There was nothing wild or strange, or seeming shameful, for what shame in love, so love be true, and not as yours is, nothing. Poor Vivian had not done to win his trust, who called her what he called her, all her crime, all, all, all the wish to prove him wholly hers. She mused a little, and then clapped her hands together with a wailing shriek, and said, Stab through the heart's affections to the heart! seethe like the kid in his own mother's milk, killed with a word worse than a life of blows. I thought that he was gentle, being great. O oh God, that I had loved a smaller man! I should have found in him a greater heart. Or I, that flattering my true passion, saw the knights, the court, the king, dark in your light, who love to make men darker than they are because of that high pleasure which I had to seat you soul upon my pedestal of worship. I am answered, and henceforth the course of life that seems so flowery to me, with you for guide and master, only you, becomes the sea-cliff pathway broken short, and ending in a ruin, nothing left, but into some low cave to crawl, and there, if the wolf spare me, weep my life away killed with unutterable unkindliness." She paused. She turned away. She hung her head. The snake of gold slid from her hair. The braid slipped and uncoiled itself. She wept afresh, and the dark wood grew darker toward the storm in silence. 
while his anger slowly died within him, till he let his wisdom go. For ease of heart, and half believed her true, called her to shelter in the hollow oak. Come from the storm, and having no reply, gazed at the heaving shoulder, and the face hand-hidden, as for utmost grief or shame, then thrice essayed, by tenderest touching terms, to sleek her ruffled peace of mind, in vain. At last she let herself be conquered by him, and as the cageling newly flown returns, the seeming injured simple-hearted thing came to her old perch back, and settled there. There while she sat, half falling from his knees, half nestled at his heart, and since he saw the slow tear creep from her closed eyelid yet, about her, more in kindness than in love, the gentle wizard cast a shielding arm. But she dislinked herself at once, and rose, her arms upon her breast across, and stood, a virtuous gentlewoman deeply wronged, upright and flushed before him. Then she said, There must now be no passages of love betwixt us, Twain, henceforward evermore since, if I be what I am grossly called, what should be granted which your own gross heart would reckon worth the taking, I will go. In truth, but one thing now, better have died thrice than have asked it once, could make me stay, that proof of trust, so often asked in vain. How justly after that vile term of yours I find with grief! I might believe you then, who knows? Once more, lo, what was once to me mere matter of the fancy, now hath grown the vast necessity of heart and life. Farewell. Think gently of me, for I fear my fate or folly, passing gayer youth for one so old, must be to love thee still. But ere I leave thee, let me swear once more, that if I schemed against thy peace in this, May yon just heaven, that darkens o'er me, send one flash, That missing all things else may make my scheming brain a cinder, if I lie. Scarce had she ceased, when out of heaven a bolt, For now the storm was close above them, struck, Burrowing a giant oak, and javelining with darted spikes And splinters of the wood the dark earth round. He raised his eyes and saw the tree that shone white-listed through the gloom. But Vivian, fearing heaven, had heard her oath, and dazzled by the livid flickering fork, and deafened with the stammering cracks and claps that followed, flying back and crying out, "'O oh, Merlin, though you do not love me, save, yet save me!' clung to him and hugged him close, and called him dear protector in her fright nor yet forgot her practice in her fright, but wrought upon his mood, and hugged him close. The pale blood of the wizard at her touch took gayer colours, like an opal warmed. She blamed herself for telling hearsay tales. She'd shook from fear, and for her fault she wept of petulancy. She called him lord and liege, her seer, her bard, her silver star of eve, her God, her Merlin, the one passionate love of her whole life, and ever overhead bellowed the tempest, and the rotten branch snapped in the rushing of the river rain above them, and in change of glare and gloom her eyes and neck glittering went and came, till now the storm, its burst of passion spent, moaning and calling out of other lands, had left the ravaged woodland yet once more to peace and what should not have been, had been. For Merlin, over-talked and over-worn, had yielded, told her all the charm, and slept. Then in one moment she put forth the charm of woven paces and of waving hands, and in the hollow oak he lay as dead, and lost to life and use and name and fame then crying, I have made his glory mine, and shrieking out, O oh, fool, 
the harlot leaped adown the forest, and the thicket closed behind her, and the forest echoed, Fool! End of the story. This recording is in the public domain.